are in yeah yes sir we are at 435 sir now 36 yeah. why not you unmute yourself all ramaswami kali sir okay, okay sir. video okay very good very good welcome guys sound a little bit So good evening friends I am very very pleased to invite you on behalf of Dean Suresh Ramanathan who is joining us from Seattle Washington he just landed there and look at that he is ready for a sleepless night day you know all these things your day is our night and vice versa anyway he is here and uh, on behalf of the entire great lakes institute of management chennai which is organizing this year we will have a similar program as we did last time what we christened it as module 0 module 0 is a concept that we understood because majority of the business school students are not taught in general knowledge and at the same time they are not also though any cutting edge program like great lakes has a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge imparted by leading worldwide faculty to you on techniques tools skills sets and what not and therefore all the curriculum we follow and you learn and that is general absolutely needed iq but we also talk about eq and problem solving skills more than and that is where we bring experiential learning where we are trading on the floor in the stock market with real money and karma yoga and this kind of programs and it is essentially to train you how to think out of the box by providing less and 
returning more. And that is essentially the concept. But what is missing is, in these days, crisis management, catastrophe, how do you convert a, a challenge as an opportunity, a stumbling block as a stepping stone, as a catastrophe into a tremendous amount of opportunity? And how do we make sure that when everybody else may not be doing like what we do, but we want to make sure this as an opportunity. And therefore, we have used the time where the students are admitted, but due to the COVID and other conditions, they cannot start the class. So the class starts sometime in the third week of July. Now, what are we doing until that time? Twiddling our thumb? No. This is what I call it as money value of time, as opposed to what Shankar Narayan will be talking about, time value of money, discounted cash flows, fintech, all of them. But money value of time, why not we save and use and utilize this time to make sure what is missing is given so that you have a competitive advantage? And that was the motivation behind myself and Suresh, uh, Professor Sanjay Sarkar, program directors, in making sure that uh, we, we have a program of last time it was three months. And therefore, we had about 12 outstanding faculty, including the Dean of Harvard, Srikant Dutta, Dean of Booth, Madhav Rajan, Dean of Kellogg, uh, Deepak Jain, and Sunil Chopra, Ashwadha Modaran, amazing people, including the Nobel laureate, Bob Wilson, who is from Stanford. That was the kind of a program. And the students could not believe, and they got a fantastic deal for not paying anything. Yes, we always say there is nothing called free lunch, but there is something called super lunch add-on. So we gave you this. Similarly, on the industry side, we had some amazing people like Lakshmi, like Seja uh, Sai, Indra Nui, and these kind of people, uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah. So the point was, you had a tremendous amount of a pre-course, uh, pre-class, taking advantage of the Zoom and this particular COVID crisis into a tremendous amount of learning experience, which nobody else, including in US, can do that. And Great Lakes did that. And what was the result? 100% placement again. So a crisis, as a matter of fact, if you really look at a little story I wrote in Business India on how a person by name Srikant Dattar at the age of 67, when he's supposed to retire, got the job as a dean, whereas when he wanted to get the dean's job at 57, he did not get it because he mastered the art of crisis management. And that's it. Now this guy is going to retire in 77. So the rules can be broken. Nam is no more the nam. And there are plus and minus. Minus everybody knows. I don't want to talk about it. But stay positive. I always say, everybody says, how is you are so positive? Because my blood group is B positive. B positive. This B has a little E. So if you are positive, but I can tell you one thing. Many people say, all right, by being positive, am I going to be successful? Not necessarily. By being positive, I cannot guarantee success. But being negative, I guarantee failure. What do you want? So that's exactly the motivation behind that. And this year is no exception. And there is nobody better than Shankar Narayan, whom I know for some years. I served, I, I was the chairman of the uh, board of Alsec Technology. He was very much involved with Carlyle as managing director and co-head of the Carlyle Group. And his contribution to Alsec Technology is no small measure. And he was also on the board, his member. So I know him and he's very practical down to earth and also take advantage of this crisis. 
to convert into an opportunity. So the whole idea of module zero, which is a unique proposition from Great Lakes in terms of creating new things, which will fill up the gaps so that you have a competitive advantage. He has been conceived last year and executed extremely wonderfully last year. But that was a three months time. Now this, this time we have some new things and eliminated some other things. And at the same time, we are going to have a super time once again. So I would like to now introduce Shankar Narayanan. And you have got his bio data already sent to you by uh, Pratima and others. So I want to talk about something I know about him. Shankar has, a, has done a lot of amazing things. And one of his trunk card, like what I say, is his network. His network is his net worth. Would you believe Shankar was in IIT where Dean Suresh Ramanathan was a junior saying he's going to talk about him. But anyway, so he knows them. And not only that, there are a lot of things that have happened in many parts of India, US, Hong Kong, and other places based on his track record of Citibank. And then Carlyle, of course, all of you know, but he was also in Daisha, Daisha Bank and all these things. International, he used to use that to cultivate network. I always say your network is your net worth. And, that, and, be, and be distinct or extinct. All the time after his education from XLRI with his MBA, he was able to make sure that he cultivated a tremendous amount of network of friends, can be suppliers, can be investors, can be pa partners, can be even customers and advisors, advisees, whatever. And that Actually, he made some of the mergers and acquisitions of N. Srinivasan, who does the so-called Chennai Super Kings and India Cements and other things, was him. And his family is very grateful to him and grateful to, I did something recently. And at the same time, both of us did that. So the point I want to say is, education is very important. <laughs> and IQ is important. More than the IQ, EQ is more important. Emotions. And if you see Cartless, every stage, he is now talking about entrepreneurship and education is marketing. Not just the usual 4P. That was product focus, long time back. Now it is experience focus, entrepreneurship focus, emotions focus, creative problem solving focus. Agility focus, affordability focus. And what is that? So the tremendous amount of change is going on. So I am so pleased that we are able to have Shankar Narayan. The amount of experience in various things are in that particular sheet that you have seen. So in the light of time, I do not want to take any more of your time. So let us, and today, today is the inauguration. We have surpassed. 450. I thought that the Zoom constraint is 500. So there are more than 300 to 400 people are joining via YouTube also. So without much ado, let us give a very, very big warm welcome to the one and only Shankar Narayan, a true friend, true philosopher, true guide, and a true person who puts theory into practice and brings the whole country along. He generally housed in both Hong Kong and US, but of course his affinity to Chennai is also not in small measure. Hopefully when a school opens, he will come physically to Chennai and give another lecture. Shankar, all of us, thank you very much on behalf of the entire Great Lakes of Institute of Management, both Chennai and Gurga who will be listening to you and 
Sanjay uh, Sarkar, the program director, will moderate, and Suresh Ramanathan will give a word of thanks. I'll be with you. Throw. Thank you, Shankar. Thanks for yeah. your time. Uh, thanks, Professor Bala. Um, I'm a great admirer of Professor Bala. Uh, I think Professor Bala has made a remarkable contribution in, in many ways to his country of its birth by setting up Great Lakes. It has impacted literally the lives of thousands of people and thousands of families, uh, and it is important. What I'll try to do during this talk, uh, I think in the second part of the talk, I'll try and speak about venture capital, growth capital, uh, buyouts, et cetera. But what I'll try and do is try and speak about my life experience. And since all of you are students who are gonna go out into the real world, <clears throat> what are the things that I benefited from? Uh, what are the mistakes you can do? Uh, so that uh, at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening, uh, it is uh, not dull and drab, but a little interesting. Uh, so, so the key thing to remember, the only system that has taken people out of poverty in the history of mankind uh, are free markets. And free markets are a system of rewarding human resourcefulness, enterprise, hard work, judgment. Uh, so all of you should remember uh, that this is the system. So if you want rewards, uh, it is completely dependent on what you are, you know, because society can't guarantee outcomes. It can guarantee only opportunity. And all of you are very fortunate that you're all uh, having advantage of such a great place like Great Lakes uh, Management Institute. Uh, so I'll briefly speak about my own life story uh, and say what I did uh, right and what I did wrong. Um, and the most important thing you should always remember every day as an individual, you should be very honest to yourself and make sure you have learned something new, read something new. So if there is one thing that has helped me throughout my life is the habit of reading. You know, I, I, I read prodigiously and I read anything and everything. I'm an investor, so it becomes very, very important that you read a lot of things because you never know what are the dots you have to connect. So I grew up in Chennai. I went to a school called Padma Shishadri in Chennai, which is a fabulous school run by a fabulous lady uh, who's one of the most remarkable people I've known in my life. Uh, and then I went to IIT Delhi, uh, you know, um, and uh, uh, IIT Delhi, I think I spent more time reading. Uh, and when I was speaking to Nitin Noria, he was the same batch as me, but from IIT Bombay, I think the one common thing we had was uh, we read a lot of things except engineering, uh, you know, and I think it has stood us in good uh, stead. Uh, but anyway, towards my fourth year, I became enamored of Iron Rand, and I decided I did, after all, want to try being an engineer. And I was the only guy in my batch. I was studying civil engineering. I got uh, nine, ten government jobs. I didn't take them. Uh, I went and joined a private company, and I was the only guy from my batch of about 50 kids uh, who became a site engineer. And I joined a firm called Bahadpur Cooling Tars. And in those days, you became in charge of a uh, construction site after about... 12, 14, 15 years of experience. Uh, I became in charge of a site in three months. And I really thought that, uh, and those, this is 1984, so you wrote inland letters to your parents. So I, I, I wrote to my parents telling that, uh, look, I've become in three months in charge of a site, which normally takes people 15 years um, because I'm a genius, I work very hard, I'm brilliant and all of that. My poor mother believed all of it. Uh, my father was a lot more skeptical. And the truth was that site was a law and order problem site and no one in the company wanted to go there. Uh, you know, it was a place where people extorted money by keeping country made pistols at you and all of that. So I spent a year and a half that, uh, you know, where you see certain parts of India where things are difficult, uh, you know, and, that, and it all boils down to choices. Then you have a situation where your interaction is, is with a government agency. So people want you to pay money. And eventually, you know, I think, when you go out in the real world, you should have a strong moral compass if you want to avoid trouble in your life. And I was very clear that I didn't want to do anything that was dishonest. And I think it has stood me very well in life. So when you go out of the place, you will always find uh, situations where the easier thing may be to do something dishonest, pay someone money, cut corners, not follow laws, uh, not comply with pollution norms. Uh, all of them, you know, uh, these you know, uh, you know, short, short term gratification, shortcuts, etc. is a terrible idea if you're building uh, a career. And one of the people I really admire is a gentleman called P.S. Pai, who used to run Wipro's consumer business. And we used to exchange notes 
uh, how he also had faced these choices in his life uh, and he took uh, you know the right uh, decision always and that is when you think that you know you know every human being has 24 hours and 7 days a week and then you think there are certain economic activities that are rewarded more uh, you know and you should always when you're in a career see what is your aptitude and is there some activity that will reward me more that i can do uh, so you have a strong moral comp compass you're willing to work very hard you're very knowledgeable so when i was spending time in that construction site that is when i decided that look i like investing maybe i do a mba and uh, you know probably try and uh, uh, look to see if i can do something better and that is how uh, I went to Excelara and I joined Citibank as a trader. And uh, Citibank was a fabulous place those days. It was a great meritocracy. Uh, and uh, the trading room, the structure was very flat. Uh, so everyone was assessed based on their own individual's ability. Now, in the late 80s, early 90s, the way you made a career in Citibank is you spent a couple of years in India and then tried and found a job somewhere else abroad, you know, New York, London, Tokyo, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, somewhere, and became part of city's international bureaucracy. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, at that time, I'd never worked for this gentleman, Aditya Puri, who went on to uh, establish HDFC uh, and build it very successfully, but he had a very good impression of me, and he used to be a division risk manager. He made me an offer to go as country risk manager in Taipei. Now, Taipei was not exactly in New York. Uh, I was a trader. I was going to take a staff job up. Uh, but anyway, they said they'll move me back to options trader or rates trader or something a little later after I spent a couple of years. Um, uh, so I used to go around telling people I'm going to find a wife and go to Taipei because I was told going to Taipei without a wife was a terrible idea because you don't know the language, you won't like the food, you won't have anyone to talk to. Uh, so one of the persons I used to, you know, do complex structure transaction was a gentleman called Rajan Raheja, uh, extraordinarily bright gentleman. And in many ways, uh, it was a relationship that had benefited me. And this is the other lesson that I would tell each of you students. Uh, you should always plan on building your own financial security. Uh, you know, saving money is a very good idea. When I started life, yeah. I used to save almost 80, 85% of my take home pay. I, I used to save money. I never used to spend money on anything. Uh, you know, and I generally try to keep that ratio uh, because it helps uh, over a long period of time. And you should invest it. So, so one of those really random things happened. Um, partly, I used to read Buffett's letters to shareholders. So one of the things Buffett used to say, you did 10 foolish things, it didn't become a smart thing. Um, so I actually chose to put all my savings into one stock. Um, I had bought some land uh, in Chennai, which is done very well near the airport. But apart from that, I used to buy this one stock. And when that company went public in SEBI's offer document, I was the eighth or ninth largest shareholder of that stock. And I made something like 1,500 times my money. So I was not very senior in Citibank. I put very little money. But at the end of the day, it gave me lifelong financial security. So one good decision in life uh, can take care of almost everything you need in life. So always remember that because, uh, you know, and which is why reading, having a knowledge, having a sense of how things go on uh, will help you enormously because the same opportunity would come in front of many people. And a lot of people are not able to seize the opportunity because they don't understand it. Maybe they don't have the risk appetite for it. So to each of you students, what I would say, is always be alert because there are always opportunities that will come to you in life and you should be in a position to take it forward. So anyway, so instead of going to Taipei as country risk manager, I was 30 years old. Uh, so this gentleman, Raheja, offered me to become uh, the CEO and managing director uh, of his investment company and he wanted to buy companies. Uh, now, the other thing that helps if you read even if you don't have specific experience, is you can always try and grow into a role. And which is why throughout my life, I have not been a big fan of specific experience in people, but I look for people who have drive, hunger, ingenuity, uh, desire to work very hard, uh, as opposed to someone who has long experience, but a terrible attitude. Uh, you know, so I look for people uh, always like that. And that was the chance at that time uh, Reja took on me, 
Uh, so I, I was probably more Forrest Gump than private equity guy at that stage. And the first company that came our way was a company called Johnson Tiles. It was set up in 1958. It was the largest ceramic tile company in India. Um, and, um, you know, and my only idea of how deals were done was what I'd read in Warren Buffett's letters to shareholders, which is, uh, you know, you study the balance sheet, you do your back of the envelope calculations, and uh, you look the guy in his eye and buy it. You know, so between our auditor who drew up the share purchase agreement, Raja and me, we didn't even know that we had to do a due diligence. But anyway, we bought the company for 36 crores, I remember. We could have, you know, um, uh, you know, and we paid the money in two, three days, I think, because we didn't do a diligence or anything. There wasn't management. So that was the first time I ran a company as CEO. Look, I was 30 years old. All I had done was run a construction site and worked as a trader. So I ran Johnson Tiles for about a year. For many years, I used to be the chairman of the Indian Tile and Sanitary Wear Manufacturers Association. After a year, I got a CEO, and we really grew the business. You know, uh, you know, just developing the land where the first factory set up in 1958, uh, we made uh, a couple of hundred crores out of it. So the investment worked out very well for us. Uh, because some of the certain basic things we got right, though I was terribly inexperienced at that point in time. Uh, you know, then we got control of Excite, uh, which I pretty much was very much involved in running, which today is a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, we did Hathway Cable. Uh, we were the people who funded Asianet when it started. Uh, we had partnerships with Franklin Templeton in asset management, uh, with the O'Broys in hotels. Uh, so it was a very, very interesting stint. Uh, you know, and, but the opportunity when it came, you know, instead of being part of the city's bureaucracy, I uh, think uh, uh, I felt this looked on the face of it a little more riskier, uh, but I did end up uh, taking that uh, uh, as an opportunity. It was a great learning experience. I learned a lot. And after that, I did my first stint overseas where I worked for Deutsche Bank uh, for a gentleman called Ted Virtue, who runs a very successful uh, a private equity firm of his own, known as Mid Ocean Partners, um, and I think he's one of the. He's probably the only private equity guy who's got an Oscar for Best Picture, because he funded making of uh, this uh, movie called Green Book. Um, and after that, I came back to India, um, and again, I've uh, spent slightly more than 13 years with the Carlyle Group. Uh, first, as the head of the mid market and bio, a small buyout business in India, and then co head of Asia based out of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, it has really been a very, very interesting uh, kind of stint. Uh, so, that is uh, broadly my sense uh, of career. So, based on my experience, what I would say is um, each of you should ensure that if, at the end of every day, you have learned something new and you're a better person uh, in terms of knowledge, in terms of attitude. Um, and I think integrity is very, very important in life. Uh, it is always easy to take shortcuts and compromise, and uh, it will always haunt you. You know, you cannot build a long career uh, if you took shortcuts, uh, you know, and I always tell it to every portfolio company of mine where I invest, uh, let us do it the hard work way, because these shortcuts will destroy far more value than you would save it. The second thing is always look out for opportunities because you don't know when it'll come. If you're prepared, uh, whether it is career-wise, whether it is an investment opportunity, take it uh, and it'll help you uh, enormously. Now coming to the whole private equity kind of space, um, I will start with the growth capital and mid-market uh, buyout business because that is where I've probably spent uh, the most time. And then I'll speak about the larger buyout businesses and the venture capital business. But this illiquid asset category has been one of the great success stories uh, of the last uh, two decades, I would say. Low interest rates and uh, tremendous growth um, of businesses have resulted in you know, multi-billion dollar businesses emerging out of nowhere, uh, fueled you know, by access uh, to risk capital. Because the India of the 70s and early 80s, the 60s, 70s, early 80s, was more about traditional fab families who control businesses. You had a license raj. Uh, you had uh, a lot of constraints in doing business. With the coming of the IT re the revolution, with the access of people to capital, etc., 
you know, uh, people from middle class backgrounds uh, are able to build fortunes based more on the power of their idea, the strength of their work ethic, uh, their own drive, hunger, ingenuity, etc. And that has been so in growth capital, which is what I do, uh, you know, my approach is very simple. You know, companies are like humans. You know, if you're writing the GMAT exam, you keep getting 500 in your practice test, you're not going to get 800 when you go write it. So in real life, toads don't become princesses. Uh, you know, so if you're looking at it and you think this miraculous turnaround is going to happen, the probability is very much against you. So you're better off betting against someone who has a track record. So typically, we look for businesses that are growing 25, 30, 35%. Uh, you know, profitable businesses, uh, then try not to buy an egg for the price of a chicken. Don't overpay for the asset. Then your IRR would pretty much mirror that kind of return you have. Um, now, in markets like India, there is one very important thing. And I think over the years, I've become pretty good at it. I never part with money when I'm investing in a company uh, until I go meet the guys, um, you know, uncle, aunt, wife, grandmother, kids, et cetera, uh, to primarily understand two things. One, his own drive, hunger, ingenuity, et cetera. But the most important thing is his integrity. If he's a guy who takes shortcuts, who wants to do all of it, uh, you know, the world is a big place. So, uh, you know, uh, so you don't need to do that uh, uh, because, um, uh, you know, the probability your outcome may not be good if you, you know, went to bed with someone like that uh, may, may be high uh, in that kind of situation. So after I have started Sanaka, for example, we've seen more than a thousand deals. Uh, we have done four. So we are very choosy about doing deals. And especially on investment ideas, what I would say is, you know, the amount of capital is always finite. Okay, so, you know, if you miss too many good deals, you have a problem. But if you miss a deal or two that is good, it's not a big problem. It's a bigger problem if you did bad deals. And so it becomes very, very important that, you know, you have a very high bar uh, for the deals you do, uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, if like Professor Bala uh, always tells me, you know, your network is your network, uh, it becomes very important when you pro provide capital uh, to be like a catalyst in transforming that management from a small business uh, to a multi-billion dollar business. So if you looked at my career, you know, uh, Excite is a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, you know, Prism, Mercer, and Johnson Tiles uh, is uh, again worth uh, a couple of thousand crores. Uh, so there are a lot of the Quest uh, engineering design company on board, board I used to sit uh, is probably worth about two, two and a half billion. You know, it's a large uh, engineering de design business that literally emerged uh, out of nowhere. So businesses, uh, you know, if they grow on a continual basis at 25, 30, 35%, uh, they can, uh, in a relatively, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, in about a decade or so, become extremely valuable businesses. Uh, so it becomes very, very important. You look for businesses like this uh, that have a competitive advantage and that are growing um, uh, uh, at this kind of thing. Then coming to the venture capital space, um, I have professionally never invested venture capital. I've personally done a lot of it. And there are multiple ways to, to do it. Um, and um, I've had a lot more successes than I thought I would have. Um, and um, uh, I enjoy doing it because you meet young people who are very driven, uh, who have great ideas. Uh, some of them at times uh, are not great ideas. Um, I've given money to people uh, who have had what I thought was terrible ideas, but because I thought the guy was very good and very adaptable, and um, I remember I invested with a friend of mine from Chennai in a, a business uh, uh, where my friend told, look, this idea is terrible. I told him, yes, I agree, the idea is terrible, but the guy is good. And uh, he's going to figure out that uh, uh, he needs to change the idea. And sure enough, he changed uh, that idea and he sold his business for about five, 500 pros or so to Reliance. And uh, we all did well in that. Um, I'd invested in another business, which has become, uh, you know, the uh, chain of largest cancer hospitals in India. So when I do venture, for me, you know, the founder and the management team is probably more important than the idea. You know, the idea is very important, but if uh, uh, I thought 
the founders were average and the idea was terrible, I won't give the money. But if the founders were extraordinary, uh, then they will always find a way to adapt, change the idea, etc. cetera. Um, and I would, uh, uh, you know, in this audience, whoever is interested in investing, uh, you know, you guys should go out, see what is happening in the venture capital space um, and actively take an interest and see uh, whether it is an uh, artificial intelligence machine learning idea, whether it is some kind of marketplace idea or whatever it is, uh, you know, and uh, there are a lot of platforms, whether it is Chennai Angels, uh, uh, One Crowd or any of these uh, platforms um, that have a lot of investing ideas. You don't even need to put money uh, and invest. Uh, you know, you could just track them, and over a period of time, you know, um, uh, see uh, uh, form an opinion, and then uh, eventually, when you have an opportunity, uh, deploy capital. You know, Warren Buffett used uh, always says he spends 70, 80 percent of his time reading. So I would again come back to that point. Uh, you know, whatever profession you are, knowledge is power. That used to be the motto of the school I went to in Chennai. Uh, uh, you've got to read. And um, and uh, like I tell my kids, you know, I can't die and you can't go to heaven. You want to go to heaven, you, you got to die yourself. So hard work uh, really helps. And the starting point for people in our kind of business, whether we end up as finance professionals or marketing professionals, is reading. You know, reading helps you become a leader. Uh, reading gives you a perspective. Reading helps you uh, understand fairly complex things when you encounter them for the first time. You know, uh, Great Lakes is a great institution, but Great Lakes can't teach you everything. But what Great Lakes can teach you is an approach uh, to how to handle problems, uh, how to look at problems, and what supplements what uh, you learn at Great Lakes is the reading you do, uh, you know, and um, a lot of people these days uh, read less, partly because, you know, there's a lot more visual medium, et cetera, that is there, uh, but uh, reading helps you express things very well. So I would really tell all of you who are interested in your careers, uh, read a lot. Uh, you know, um, when I was in IIT, I spent very little time uh, studying engineering or doing those classes, but I, I still, feel that every day I read a lot. And that reading is what eventually, I think, helped me a lot uh, in my life. The other part of the thing, um, the uh, private equity business, are the big buyout uh, kind of deals. And that has been fueled essentially because leverage is very cheap. Uh, you know, If you put a reasonable amount of leverage, wrote a reasonable equity check, and you know, grew the business even only five, ten percent because uh, the cost of leverage is low, uh, so low. Uh, you could make a very good IRR in that business, and that is how the great buyout companies like Carlyle, Blackstone, Apollo, uh, all have emerged. You know, the ability to put leverage, you know, get you know professional management who are committed to run businesses uh, better. Uh, you know, and uh, and if you looked at India, you know, today, uh, where are the uh, opportunities uh, to invest? Uh, if you looked at India, there are two broad trends. You know, first is the trend, if you took every OECD country, um, every company operating there has to give a better product or a better service at a cheaper price year after year and grow their earnings. You know, the great Indian success stories, uh, whether it is TCS, Infosys, Wipro, HCL, Mindtree, they've all emerged because of this need uh, in the developed market to get people who constantly are able to give a better product or better service for their customers every year after year on better terms. And so it becomes very, very important for businesses to innovate. You know, if, if you ever came across a business that doesn't think about innovation, doesn't have a certain degree of paranoia, it may not be a good idea uh, for you to invest in it. So, you know, and you will see a lot of businesses emerging in India that are not the TCS and Wipros of the world, uh, but could be businesses like a Zoho or Freshworks 
uh, etc. in the making. You know, these are companies that have come out of nowhere and are worth uh, several billion dollars today. Uh, and that will always be there. Uh, you know, that, that, that is one. And I won't say this whole uh, so-called outsourcing is restricted to tech and tech-enabled uh, space. Um, I, I think generic pharmaceuticals is a great space, especially generic injectables, et cetera. Um, at, uh, you know, certain kinds of specialty chemicals, uh, certain kind of um, engineering products, engineering design. Uh, you know, so if you took something like this, uh, it's a huge catalyst for the Indian economy, you know, because I think exports probably constitute 17, 18, 19% uh, of GDP. And, uh, and we have a young populace, the populace is growing. If you took a developed country, say for argument in Western Europe, say Denmark, uh, you know, all the roads are concretized, all the bridges are made, everyone has a house, everyone has a car, uh, where do you get growth? But in India, there are still a lot of roads to be made, still a lot of bridges to be made, still a lot of houses for people to be made, still a lot of cars to be made. Uh, so we will certainly get that growth. So I'm one of those optimistic people. And, and if you took the United States, it probably took about 100 years from the end of the Civil War uh, for the country to grow and grow and become one of the largest economies in the world. Um, I think in countries like China and India, it is happening in a much shorter time. So you will see you know, the great corporations like whether it is General Electric or Coca-Cola, et cetera, that emerged out of the US, you'll see great corporations emerging out of India, whether it is in the healthcare space, whether it is in the consumer space, whether it is in the financial services space, uh, most people don't realize today HDFC Bank uh, uh, is one of the is probably the most valuable bank in the whole world. Uh, you know because they have uh, you know produced remarkably consistent performance both from a risk perspective as well as uh, a growth perspective. Uh, you know so. So that is the way. Um, I think I've taken my a lot of 30 minutes. So why don't we pause for questions? Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Nalan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll yeah. uh, try to group these questions. There are lots of questions from students that are, we have got almost more than 500 people here. Uh, we do some specific themes. Uh, so the first question, it comes from Tanmay. Actually, it follows on one of the observations that you made, which is stones don't become princesses. Uh, so his question is, how do you determine if a company is worth acquiring? Are there any specific parameters that you look at? No, no, I'll come again. I missed the question. Yeah. His question is, how do you determine if a companies, which companies are worth acquiring? Are there any specific parameters that you look for? See, the thing is, um, I don't think there is any formula which tells you what company is good or what company is bad. And neither is there a formula that tells you what is the price you can pay for a company or not. Uh, now, if you looked at a Rothko painting, uh, you know, uh, someone who doesn't know who Rothko is will tell you it is, uh, I won't pay more than a thousand rupees for it. But someone who knows what a Rothko painting is worth would pay a hundred million for it. Uh, so there isn't uh, any formula and there isn't any shortcut. It is uh, just, um, it's very judgment oriented. You know, uh, there are certain basic math and metrics that goes into looking for what a business is good and what a business is in. But here is the analogy I'll give. Um, uh, you know, in Chennai, you know, if you just drive around Chennai, uh, you'll see a lot of construction sites. You know, there are people who do hard physical labor at the construction site. Uh, they, they do work that probably none of us are capable of doing, but they make far less money than any of us. And then you wonder why, and that is the nature of economics. So when you look at a company, you know, there are companies that are the equivalent of a construction site laborer, and there are companies uh, that are like uh, investment banking professional or a private equity professional or a cardiologist uh, who get paid highly. So look for businesses where return in equity is high. There's some kind of franchise value. There is some kind of defensibility of the business. 
the prognosis of its future is very good. Um, they are the kind of business, uh, even at this nascent stage, uh, will show a lot of uh, potential. But there is a sense of judgment, uh, you know, and judgment always comes from knowledge. And, all the, and that is why, I again, go back to my favorite point, reading is what gets you knowledge. Uh, otherwise, you're always guessing. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> the next question is from uh, Raghuram. His question is, what are the lessons that you have learned from bad investments that you have made? See, I, I haven't done too many bad investments, but I have had difficult investments. Um, and uh, uh, I, I would again always say, you know, um, you know, stick to the basics. You know, a good investment idea is generally a simple idea. If someone came to you with something really complex, uh, the chance it will turn out to be a good investment is low you know and especially in my professional life like i said uh, look for the dna based uh, not on his promise of what he would do in future but based on what he's achieved so far uh, margins again generally tend to be very sticky you know if a company is making a four percent margin the probability he'll make an eight percent margin is very very low uh, you know so margins tend to be sticky uh, if a guy has never made money in his life uh, in five years, and you see a lot of investment proposals where the guy says uh, he's going to turn the corner uh, the next year, um, and highly unlikely, uh, highly unlikely, uh, you know. So, but at the same time, I would caveat, uh, you know, that by saying that, um, you know, some of the great stories of our time, you know, uh, like Amazon, et cetera, the businesses that had great potential because they saw a need uh, uh, with the customer and then they went and executed it flawlessly. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, there isn't any single magic formula that is there, but each of them, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, is very unique. I, I think in one of um, Warren Buffett's letters to uh, shareholders, he said, that it took more than 50 years uh, for my eyes to connect with my brain, you know? From the time I was a kid, I've been having cherry Coke, uh, but it never occurred to me what a great franchise it is. Um, and I never made an investment. So he told it was after so many years uh, that it did. So I would say, you know, be very, very aware, uh, uh, you know, of uh, your environment and what is happening. And once you see a certain thing, dig deeper. You know, that is what uh, gives you conviction that your gut or instinct is good. So if, um, I think there was a movie called The Big Shot on this whole mortgage collapse and Lehman collapse, et cetera. Uh, so those guys, uh, you know, saw something was happening in the mortgage market and they actually went down, I think, to Florida or wherever. And uh, they really saw, you know, these strippers, uh, uh, you know, having three and four houses, uh, you know, virtually putting up no equity and a lot of these houses all empty. And then they knew they was onto something and uh, they came back and uh, shorted uh, those securities and ended up making a lot of money. So, uh, you know, there is nothing as good as being very aware of your environment and validating it uh, with uh, observation. Uh, these two questions are linked uh, from Soundarya and Sanket. Uh, their question is, how do you know when is it time to exit your position in a company? And the link questions that they have is when you are talking about investment as such, uh, is it about head or about heart? You know, means I'm not a big fan of emotional investing. It never ends well. So, <laughs> you know, uh, because, uh, you know, a gut helps, but uh, your gut or your instinct is 
primarily based on uh, what goes through your head, you know, because if it's purely hard, you might as well toss a coin and do something, you know, that uh, uh, is like gambling, you know, you buy a lottery ticket and hope uh, you win a prize. Um, uh, that doesn't happen. So uh, you, you need some kind of rational basis. Uh, but uh, investing is not like you have five equations and five unknowns. Uh, you know, you may have a hundred unknowns and two equations. You know, so uh, it it is um, it is a bit like that. Uh, in terms of an exit situation, it depends on what your situation is. If you are a fund, you have a finite life, uh, then you make a certain amount of money, etc. You could uh, exit it. But one criterion, if you're an individual, you buy a listed stock and you want to know whether you should keep it or not. Um, I think people who do well in listed stock are people who hold equity for a long period of time. And the reason for that is if a company is compounding at a fairly attractive rate, uh, it makes very little sense to exit it. So for every dollar of retained earning, uh, if they're generating a substantial return on that retained earning, uh, you know, typically companies that have a high return on equity, for example, uh, you could ride it for a long time. And you're in an environment today where interest rates are so low. So if a company, and there, there are a lot of companies in India whose return on equity is 30%, 40%, 50%. You know, why would you uh, sell that company at all when it continues to be compounding at that rate? So more than a market trend, what I would look at is uh, what is the prognosis for the earnings growth of that company going forward. Uh, you know, so, and if you didn't uh, need money to buy a house or get married or send a child to college in the US, uh, you know, you hold on to your share till you need that money. Uh, the next question I have is from a couple of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, Dev Tanu and Praharsha. Uh, they said that, you know, you have said that when you are looking at an investment or a company, you prioritize management over ideas. So the question they have is they are essentially freshers who have got ideas. And so when you have got freshers who do not really have a CV or a resume backing them up, uh, how do you uh, judge the quality of the management? See, uh, see, a lot of people I've given money essentially are freshers. Uh, that company called GoFind, which got sold to Reliance, they were kids fresh out of IIT Bombay. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, capability doesn't depend on age, uh, you know, at all. Uh, you, know, you know, and which is why if you see uh, in horse racing, it is a particular skill to buy a filly, uh, you know, and uh, there are people who can predict... Uh, uh, you know, based on various parameters, which all will become successful and which won't. You know, it's a bit of a skill. Uh, um, uh, you'll figure out a way uh, to judge it, but it, it, it is very much a judgment thing. So, um, and it's all uh, uh, again about probability. You know, if a guy has gone to IIT or MIT or something and is trying to do it, um, the probability he's capable is high, um, but um, I had a situation where you know one of the toppers in IIT had come to me with an idea, and I met them, and uh, I really went saying that uh, I want to give money to them, um, but when I was driving back to my hotel in San Francisco city, I said no, uh, you know this may not be good because there was not one guy among the three who had what I call baniya buddhi. You know, eventually you succeed in business if you have a business instinct. Uh, if you're purely technical, you don't. And, and uh, for me, that Baniya Buddhi, or what you call the business instinct, uh, is a very, very important factor uh, when you uh, uh, back someone. Because if the team doesn't have it, uh, you know, uh, the business won't go anywhere. I like that word, Baniya Buddhi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Narayan, you know, your uh, career, uh, you know, you mentioned that in your first job, you used to write inland letters. So the thing is, when you look at uh, your span, you have looked at a world which, you know, has moved from inland letters to emails and WhatsApp and 
uh, a career which has gone from tiles to telecom. I mean, it's a huge and very, very broad canvas. Uh, and very typically in an MBA program, you know, we ask students to specialize and focus. So Yash has a question, which is, what do you focus on in an MBA program? You know, to be, if you have to be successful in the VC or PE space. See, there are two things to it. And Professor Bala is an exponent of it. Uh, in costing, there is a concept of sunk cost. You should always remember the education you have had is your sunk cost. Uh, you know, so uh, based on the situation is what you have to take a decision. You know, if you say that, look, I studied, uh, so suppose I had said I spent five years studying civil engineer, and uh, so I have to be a civil engineer. Uh, I don't think my career would either have been as interesting or as lucrative, uh, you know, so, uh, so that is uh, the thing. Um, you know, if you want to uh, specialize in VC or private equity or anything, uh, it is hard work because uh, when I got into private equity, uh, there, there were not many kids who were desperate to get into private equity. Today, the brightest of bright kids want to get a private equity job. So if you notice world over, whether US or Europe or anything, you know, someone who topped his class went to MIT, who went to Harvard, who went to IIT, who went to Harvard Business School or Kellogg or IMA or wherever, they all want to be in private equity. So it is, uh, it's one of those strange things where normally you would think that since so many people want to get into private equity, the wages in private equity should come down. People should make less money. It unfortunately doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, the number of people I think who get hired into it uh, is less. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, you know, uh, to be successful in life, you don't have to be in venture or private equity. You can do a million other things uh, and be successful. And uh, that depends on the situation. It depends on the aptitude. It depends on the opportunity. Uh, you know, it depends, um, uh, you know, on a whole lot of things. You know, uh, the 13 odd years I was in the Carlisle group, not one guy from my team left. So we had very low turnover, um, you know, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so I would again get back to the thing, uh, read a lot, be experienced and try to find a way uh, so that you get a chance to show how good you are. Because, uh, you know, it's, uh, Life is unfortunately like, say, you know, there are so many great cricketers who have never played for India. And there are a lot of mediocre people who have ended up playing. So a lot of it is about being at the right place at the right time, et cetera. And, uh, you know, perseverance is one of the most underrated things uh, uh, in life. You know, a lot of people who succeed are people who are extraordinarily uh, perseverant. Uh, you know, people... Uh, who have uh, the ability to bounce back from adversity. You know, there's a very beautiful uh, uh, verse in, I think, As You Like It, uh, sweet are the uses of adversity that hath fine tongues and trees, books in the running brooks, sermons and stones, and good in everything. Uh, so uh, th that is true. You know, life is never a straight line. And uh, I think one of the things, uh, ability that will help a lot is the uh, ability to handle adversity and adversity can be a personal loss adversity can be a career setback uh, adversity can be some kind of unfortunate situation for which you are not responsible etc so that kind of resilience toughness ability to get back uh, on your feet after a knockout blow uh, becomes very very important so i would say if you want a career in venture and private equity read everything about it and there's a huge amount of literature uh, uh, see what you would do, uh, you know, actively try to invest in it. Uh, that'll help enormously. Uh, you spoke, you have been, you know, you have uh, uh, repeatedly stressed about uh, the value and the benefit of reading. And I think that, you know, like your IIT days, I think we all have, uh, during our student days, have passed through the phase when we have spent the entire night of, you know, uh, reading Ayn Rand. Uh, <laughs> and some of our students, <clears throat> uh, we have got Shikha and Katani and Nikhil and all of them, Aishwarya, they would like to know uh, 
what is it that they should read about? Because there are nowadays, compared to our times as students, there are so many sources uh, uh, of see, information. Uh, see, my thing is, um, I have read everything from the Quran to the Bible, uh, to the Upanishads, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, in fact, my wife finds it crazy that I could even talk about, uh, you know, politics in Burkina Faso and why Thomas Sankara was assassinated by Blaise Compaere and what it is. Because the problem in investing is you never know what are the dots that connect you. Uh, you know, so the starting point is, you know, I read the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, local newspapers out of India, Economic Times, um, uh, and all of that. Uh, you know, reading newspapers uh, is the first starting point uh, of anything, uh, you know, because uh, that is what um, uh, helps you uh, be current. One of the great things that helped me in my life when I was a kid is we had a neighbor who, who had copies of the Reader's Digest literally from the 1930s. And those days, Reader's Digest was a fabulous uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, monthly booklet. Um, and, um, you know, I, uh, I developed a love. Uh, there was an author called Michner who wrote about South Africa and a book called Covenant, Poland, uh, Hawaii, and uh, Alaska, and all of that. Uh, uh, you know, it gave details about the human body, for example, uh, in a fabulous kind of way. Uh, so uh, when I look at a pharmaceutical investment, uh, I have a really good idea about uh, how things uh, work. Uh, you know, so uh, like I told you, my daughter finished uh, medicine and, uh, you know, I'd gone to Trinity College and, uh, you know, and uh, there, there was a question that if your kidneys fail, you know, uh, is there any other organ in your body that could function uh, like your kidneys for a period of time. Um, and because I used to read <laughs> those readers digest thing, I knew the answer to it, uh, you know, which is uh, basically the membrane that covers your stomach called the peritoneum uh, uh, by osmosis, uh, you know, for a period of time, you can do what is called the peritoneal dialysis. But, uh, you know, so I, I could always say, I'm going to be a finance guy. Uh, why should I read those? Uh, so I will encourage as broad and as deep a reading as possible uh, because, you know, when I started running the ceramic tile company, what gave me the confidence was uh, I believed I could truly understand the entire ceramic technology, which I did, um, without too much difficulty. So it is that confidence because in life you face situations that you have never encountered before. So what do you need is some kind of a framework to understand that situation and take decisions correctly. And what a broad and deep reading does, it gives you the confidence and ability to do that. And the last question I have is uh, from Sahil and Venkatesh. Uh, it's a question I think, uh, you know, which uh, our students read about every day and uh, you get very, very conflicting views about uh, And, you know, they want to kind of mine your experience here and would like to know about your views on the cryptocurrency. I th see, it's again a personal view. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, it will end in tears for a lot of people. Now, whether it will end in tears in a month or whether it will end after 15 years, I, I have no idea. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, I, I think the technology behind it, blockchain, etc., is a great technology. It has a lot of use, uh, but currency is a medium of exchange. You know, uh, you can't have the value of currency fluctuate uh, like by 20 percent, 30 percent, you know, uh, or whatever it is. You know, that's what happened when you had inflation in Zimbabwe and the Weimar uh, Republic uh, uh, before Hitler got power. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, it certainly can't be a currency because uh, as a medium of exchange, it doesn't have stability. Um, but what exactly, it, uh, Thank you uh, I, I think the comparative thing is more like uh, there's a movie called Tulip Mania. So uh, it's more like how in the 16th or 17th century, uh, 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 Amsterdam, uh, 
You know, there was speculation and tulips. So, you know, you could speculate on anything from my head to tulips. Um, so I, I, I'm, you know, one of the more people, but some great fortunes have been made, um, you know, and some great fortunes are going to be lost. But that's the nature of free markets. Folks, I, I just want to interject. Folks, you probably know there is now some, uh, you know, some companies in Russia or whatnot are uh, holding US and majority of things on uh, like a hostage. And this is called a ransom bear. And get guess what the ransomware's currency was? Bitcoin. Please note that there is a tremendous amount of benefits of blockchain beyond Bitcoin. It is not uh, be enamored after money, but believe it or not, the trust and transparency, which was the origin of the talk of uh, Shankar Naran integrity, very, very important. The trust and transparency can be enhanced and improved with blockchain. And therefore, blockchain is different. Don't think blockchain and Bitcoin are identical. The Bitcoin is the abuse of blockchain. And believe it or not, if you are going for gambling and not investing, gambling will ruin you. Yes, it gives you a temporary kick takes you to the highest and it will be like a swan sang. So it will go away. So please be aware that the cryptocurrency is a different ball game and that is a complete speculation. And uh, I, there is no way a real Rembrandt can be substituted by a fake Rembrandt. All right. So anyway, that is a thought that I want you to think. But start, in addition to reading, going to Google also. In my opinion, Mata Pita Google Devam is more important than Mata Pita Guru Devam. Guru gives you the reading. Google gives you the knowledge. Combine the two. These are not mutually exclusive. God bless you. I will be seeing you tomorrow for my class. And we also do, in addition to this, this thing which thought, so the power of hand, enjoy the power of hand and avoid the tyranny of or. This is not a question of or, the question of and. So let us sign that. I would like to request Suresh to give the proposal. The word of thanks, call it quits. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Shankar, uh, from my side. Yeah. Besides, Great Lake side. God bless you. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shankar. And, uh, uh, you know, this was uh, truly illuminating. Of course, uh, Shankar and I share a history that goes back uh, 40 years. Would you believe it, Shankar? Yeah, 40 years. That's right. 40 years. Uh, from the day I entered the, uh, you know, the doors of uh, Nilgiri Hostel at IIT Delhi, and you were the first senior to greet me with, uh, with a very warm welcome. Uh, you know, I will always remember that day. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing to, to get to know you thereafter. Um, and, uh, you know, the long sessions of, of bridge, uh, you know, that you played and, you know, that I uh, learned, uh, you know, watching you guys, uh, you know, all of these are very, very sweet memories. And uh, I just wanted to say this was uh, a truly amazing uh, session, simply because of the fact that I think you uh, you shared your perspectives in a way that I think everyone could actually relate to, because I think ultimately, you know, while investing, uh, you know, maybe a fairly complex uh, thing, there are so many moving parts, uh, you know, in, in this entire process, I think the fundamentals uh, and two, two very, very basic fundamentals that you reiterated one knowledge is power, which you gained from your PSBB days uh, in Chennai and arming yourself with knowledge at all times is, is the most important thing to do for anybody. Uh, the lazy mind basically just 
uh, wastes its time not reading, not looking at information, not processing anything that is, uh, you know, seemingly irrelevant, but, you know, could be relevant down the road. You know, today, something that seems irrelevant to you could be very, very, uh, you know, relevant to you. As you talked about the the kidney example, I was thinking about exactly that, you know, that you related something that you had read many, many years ago to, uh, you know, to a situation that you had at that point. And so knowledge is never irrelevant. Knowledge is only something that you basically process uh, continuously and, and just read voraciously. Uh, you know, I think that's a message that everyone in this generation needs to get. I think this is so important for everybody. Read broadly, read deeply, both are equally important. And the second point that you, uh, you know, emphasized was the, the importance of integrity. And again, this, this notion of integrity is so important, so vital to everybody. Today, there is so much temptation out there to take shortcuts, to cut corners, to, uh, you know, uh, and I, I keep saying this, you know, there's a message that I give to all the students. Today, you may get away. Today, you may, you know, cheat on an exam or do something and, you know, you may, you may get an A grade. Maybe we don't realize that, you know, that is, uh, you know, maybe the professor doesn't catch it. You get emboldened. And the next step you do is, okay, you, 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 uh, you know, you, you do something more dishonest on something else and something else. And then as you grow in your organization, uh, you know, you keep taking those shortcuts and, you know, eventually there will be a day when you become like Bernie Madoff, right? Who gets basically uh, caught for, for something and, and spends 150 years in jail. So why take shortcuts. And I think what you emphasize this role of integrity is, is absolutely vital. And the third point was simply the fact that, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, your career and your future, uh, think about planning and uh, compounding what you have learned, right? So whether it is investments, whether it is knowledge, the idea that you should be in it for the long term is something very important that, you know, that people need to get out of it. Um, so I think it's, you know, these are very uh, powerful messages. And of course, thank you for sharing all your perspectives from your own experience. Uh, these were uh, absolutely amazing. I think all, all our students benefited from it and the questions were coming fast and furious. I, I, you know, I know we don't, didn't have the time to basically, uh, you know, address all the questions that everybody had. But um, thank you, Shankar. And I look forward to, uh, you know, uh, chatting with you uh, sometime soon and, uh, and hoping to welcome you to campus the next time you are in Chennai and uh, when things are a little safer. Uh, thank you. Thank you all and God bless you all. Thank you very much. And I would really like to thank Professor Bala. He's a person I admire a lot. And I think each of you should see from his track record extraordinarily successful and he has contributed back to society by establishing such a great institute like Great Lakes. It needs a lot of guts, it needs a lot of drive, it needs a lot of commitment to society. Uh, you know, he could uh, keep his legs up and enjoy life, but instead he has spent so much of his time establishing Great Lakes. It's one of the truly remarkable things. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Shankar, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Everything is going all right. Thank you very much. Thank you.